We're going to get restarted again. Our first speaker is Dr. Lisa Daniel. She's one of the pulmonary care medicine attendees here at Emory. She'll be speaking to us about a year review for medical critical care. So we're going to try to cover five different trials here in some cases of what we've learned in the past year in critical care medicine. So our objectives are we're going to um, do some updates in medicine, examine the evidence, and then go over how this may or may not impact our practice. Here's our first case. Mr. Evans is a 65-year-old male. He's admitted to the medical intensive care unit with septic shock and acute hypoxic respiratory failure from community-acquired pneumonia. He's on high flow, oxygen, and vasopressors. He denies any alcohol use, and you notice QTC is 350. You're called because he's pulled out a central line, and you note that he's CAM ICU positive. So based on MIND USA, which of the following is true for patients in the ICU? A, decreased incidence of ICU delirium is associated with prophylactic haloperidol or zisprazidone. B, a decreased duration of ICU delirium is associated with haloperidol or zisprazidone. C, neither haloperidol or zisprazidone improved duration of ICU delirium. D, decreased duration and incidence of ICU delirium with haloperidol, haloperidol or zisprazidone. Or E, uh, patients in the ICU had a decreased duration of delirium with both haloperidol and zisprazidone were given. In. Okay. okay, good job. So we're going to go over this. So um, we'll go over this case, but if the answer was right, you guys, most of you got it, that neither Halopanol or Zespresso improved ICU delirium. So let's look back on some prior evidence. So prior to this trial, based in the 1990s, we first realized that haldol panadol on a continuous infusion based on a trial of eight patients in the ICU, it did decrease the rate of agitation and the amount of uh, bolus sedation that they required. And then we started to realize how bad delirium was, that it increased the risk of bad outcomes, including um, cognitive impairment and long-term consequences. So in 2002, the guidelines were updated to include the use of um, haloperidol in treatment of her ICU delirium. And since then, there's been a few cohort or observational studies that have found that we are prescribing haloperidol or antipsychotics in about 11% of all ICU comers. And of those 11%, 25% of those will have it um, continued on discharge from the ICU, which is kind of a problem. So we started looking into the ICU of if there is evidence for using this for ICU delirium. And in two small randomized trials in the critically ill, haloperidol wasn't um, shown to demonstrate a decreased duration of ICU delirium. And then looking at the atypicals, um, there's been inconsistent evidence. There was a study by Delvin and his colleagues in 2010 that did have some evidence that maybe we are able to decrease duration of delirium with haloperidol and quetiapine. So this led to the MIND ICU trial. So they did look at um, haloperidol versus prazidone versus placebo, and this prazidone was chosen uh, mostly to, to get FDA clearance for this. And they looked at treatment of delirium over 14 days. They looked at patients that were in the ICU that were at high risk for delirium, so they were on mechanical ventilation, our vasopressors or had uh, mechanical support, so our patient would have qualified. And the outcome is that there was no difference in days alive without delirium in any of the groups compared to placebo. Um, things for this trial, the biggest criticism of this trial has been that uh, on table one, about 90% of 89% of patients had hypoactive delirium, but the authors have since noted that that was on uh, randomization, that if you followed the patient throughout the trial, that about 35 to 40% of them did have um, hyperactive delirium, which is similar to other trials that we have shown. Um, and then since then, some people have argued that maybe we should still be considering the use of antipsychotics in treatment and prevention of delirium um, on case-by-case -case basis and as for um, agitated delirium. And the most recent updated guidelines for the PADIS um, did include that you don't, should not be using these routinely, but you can consider in some populations. Okay. So on to our next case. So Ms. Mitchell, she's a 57-year-old female admitted to the ICU with sepsis. She's requiring fluid administration. So according to SmartMed, which of the following is true regarding patients that receive balanced solutions compared to patients that receive normal saline? Is it A, patients that had balanced solutions have reduced um, need for renal replacement therapy but no impact on renal dysfunction or mortality? 
B, that patients with balanced solutions have reduced need for renal replacement therapy and decreased re rate of persistent renal dysfunction, but no impact on mortality. C, patients with balanced solutions have reduced rate of persistent renal dysfunction, but there is no impact on the need for renal replacement or mortality. Or D, patients that receive balanced solutions have reduced rate of persistent renal dysfunction and need for renal replacement or therapy or death. Okay, so this is a closer call, so we'll go into this one. So we have an um, even split. Okay, so for the answer for this one, it, 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 they looked at a composite outcome and that balanced solution did have a reduced rate in the composite outcome of persistent renal dysfunction, um, renal replacement therapy, and death. Um, so this has been a long debate. We've been giving IV fluids since the 1830s, and we've been having these signals that perhaps normal saline isn't our best option, as it has been associated with hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis, some renal dysfunction, as well as mortality. Um, and so observational studies have suggested that we should be using these balanced solutions for these reasons. Um, in pilot trials, there have been smaller, have been unable to detect a difference. So this led to the smart med and smart surge, um, as well as the salt ED trials for looking at isotonic solutions in major adverse events. So they randomized patients that were admitted to the ICU and they gave them either normal saline or balanced solutions. And this was done every month in the ICU. So if you're admitted at the first month, you're given normal saline, the next month everyone was given a balanced solution. They didn't specify which balanced solution you gave. And they looked at this composite income, outcome of death, new renal replacement therapy, or persistent renal dysfunction. And they defined that as creatinine of 200% or more from their baseline. And they did um, detect a statistically significant difference of 15.4% uh, versus 14.3. Uh, but when you break down each individual score for this, they were not uh, statistically significant. Um, and just because this is the critical care medicine update, we will show that in the medical ICU, there was a higher um, rate of all of these outcomes, and there was a difference in the uh, medical ICU. They also started uh, um, patients with sepsis, and the larger amount of fluid you got also had a higher um, difference in the outcome favoring balanced solutions in both of those groups as well. So things to consider for this trial, this was a single center and it wasn't blinded, so the um, providers did know which month of they were getting and what fluid they were giving. Some have argued that they did not distinguish lactate ringers versus plasmolite, um, because this was not separated out. And they also did not dictate how quickly you got the fluid or how much fluid you got, so it ended up being about a liter um, was on average for each patient in the groups. So if your patient had sepsis, they got a larger amount of fluid, they're more likely to have an improvement in outcome if you gave them these balance instead of normal saline. Um, and if you're curious, there is gonna be a PLUS trial that is looking more at mortality and the difference between normal saline and LR um, with a higher mortality group of patients that should be coming out. Okay. So on to case three, Mr. O is a 68-year-old male admitted with sepsis and severe metabolic acidosis. His pH is 7.16, CO2 is 25, and his lactic acid is 2. So according to Bicar ICU, which of the following is true? So treatment with bicarbonate will improve the composite outcome of all cause mortality or the presence of at least one organ dysfunction at day seven. Two, treatment of bicarbonate does not improve mortality, but does improve the persistence of at least one organ failure at day seven. C, in patients with uh, acute kidney injury, stage two or three, treatment with bicarb has associated decreased mortality and the rate of at least one organ failure. Or D, patients with acute kidney injury, injury two or three, bicarb was not associated with decreased mortality, but was associated with improvement in organ failure. You guys are close again. Um, so for this one, it was in patients with acute kidney injury, bicarbonate was associated with a decreased mortality and a rate of organ failure. Again, this was a composite outcome. So we'll look into this trial. So in bicarb ICU, they're trying to, again, go after this bicarb, and um, for some of us that love it and some of us that hate it, trying to see if it's gonna make a difference. So they did look at um, patients in 26 different ICUs in France. 
and they um, randomize them either to bicarbonate or control. It should be noted that of this 389 uh, additional, over 100 patients were excluded because they had bicarb even before the trial started, so that's a big use. And for here, they looked at the outcome that there was no difference in the composite. So their composite outcome was one mortality, and then this at least one organ failure at day seven was defined as for each of the organ systems in the SOFA score, you had to have had a three or four per that organ system to be um, included for failure at day seven. And actually here, that's a, the mortality that's being shown. Um, the, Total composite was 71% versus 66% and organ failure was 69 versus 62. Should be noted here that they did look at a secondary outcome and a need for renal replacement therapy, which was lower in the bicarbonate group with a number needed to treat of six. And then we looked at this acute kidney injury group. This is a predefined um, group that they wanted to look at for stage two or three. And again, they looked at the same thing at the composite outcome of mortality and organ failure. And there was a difference, and there still was a difference when you broke down all cause mortality or um, organ failure by itself. Um, they also looked at adverse events, which has been some of the reasons people do not want to be giving bicarbonate. So one is hypernatremia, which was higher in the bicarb group since it was sodium bicarbonate. Uh, the other was hypocalcemia with alkalemia that can happen. Um, the two most harped on were this alkalosis, one being the alkalosis is going to decrease your oxygen delivery, so that's uh, not favored for. And then this hyperkalemia has been a, um, a big debate. So in this trial, they gave 4.2% bicarb, which is notably different than if we're pushing ANSA bicarb of 8.4%. So this is more of a similar to an isotonic or hypotonic that is known to help hyperkalemia, or when we're pushing AMSA bicarb, it doesn't have the same association. So that's been given some criticism. So other things to consider, this wasn't blind, blinded. They did, when they were administering the bicarb, they were checking blood gases and the timing was being affected. So people did know which group they were in. And, and the control group actually had 24% of the um, patients did receive bicarbonate. So it's actually impressive that we were able to show a difference. And then two other things to think about, they did not tell us what kind of acidosis these patients had. So they did have to have an elevated lactate, at least two, but your whole reason for your bicarb could have been from uremia or non-ionine gap acidosis, which is more likely to um, benefit than a lactate acidosis. So that's also been a criticism. And then the other one was um, many of these patients were on mechanical ventilation and not much of that data and compensation was reported. Okay, case four. Ms. Rogers, a 48-year-old female, admitted to the ICU with septic shock from pneumonia. She's intubated on vasopressors, going to sub-ICU, which is falling is true. Proton and pump inhibitor administration in critically ill does not improve mortality at 90 days. PPI has reduced the rate of blood transfusions in patients in the ICU and mechanical ventilation. H2 blockers are not inferior to PPIs in preventing clinically significant GI bleed in critically ill patients. And PPIs result in increased rate of C. diff diarrhea in the critically ill. So proton PrEP inhibitor does not improve mortality. So previous evidence for this. So in the 1960s, we realized that acute stress ulcer does cause hemorrhage and death in patients in the ICU. And by suppressing acid, we were actually improving mortality with number needed to treat of five. And we started recognizing risk factors at this time too. So patients that had, were on mechanical ventilation, patients that had a coagulopathy seemed to be at the higher risk. And then came along proton pump inhibitors um, and the risk that we started worrying about clostridium diarrhea and pneumonia and mortality. And then more recently, we we're starting to realize that enteral nutrition might mitigate all these risks that we initially had in the 1960s and 70s. So part of this led to the new trial of SEP ICU and stress ulcer prophylaxis in the intensive care unit. So this is a really large trial randomizing over 3,000 patients in Europe and multiple ICUs. Um, they had to have a non-elective admission to the medical or surgical intensive care unit, and they did have to have a risk factor, but they only required that they have at least one of them. So these included shock on vasopressors, being on anticoagulation, renal replacement therapy, being mechanically ventilated and expected to be so for more than 24 hours, history of liver disease, 
They also looked again at that coagulopathy, which they defined as thrombocytopenia of less than 50, iron or greater than 1.5, or previous diagnosis of uh, coagulopathy. And they did exclude patients that were already on PPIs or H2 blockers or already had a diagnosis of peptidic ulcer disease on that same hospital admission. And then with the patients that they had, they randomized them to IV pantoprazole, 40 milligrams daily, or placebo. Um, and this was done for 90 days or until they were uh, ICU discharge or death. So here, when they looked at outcome, 90-day um, mortality, there was not a big difference. So this has been argued as probably not the best outcome to look at for stress ulcer prophylaxis. Nowadays, we're really good at treating them. Um, the mortality associated isn't so high, so this would be really hard to detect a difference. And then when they looked at the combined outcome of a C. diff infection, pneumonia, GI bleed, or myocardial ischemia, um, here they also did not able, they were not able to detect a difference. But they were in the subgroup of the GI bleed, which was actually defined as over GI bleeding. And then you had to have additionally had a drop in your blood pressure. You had to either, or two units of blood were given, or a drop in hemoglobin by two. And this resulted in a number needed to treat a 59. So we did show a significance there. But when they looked at pneumonia and C. diff, um, or each of these separately, there wasn't a difference. And given how large this trial was, it's kind of sadistic that seems um, to be power that you would have been able to find a difference. So things to consider um, for this one. So one, it did decrease our GI bleed, which we talked about, and it doesn't seem to have the association with the pneumonia and C. diff that we were worried about. So maybe it's not as scary as we thought, and maybe it does help our bleed, which is a, um, a clinical indicator for patients to be important for. Uh, but they also reported that there were no serious adverse events, which is uh, it, despite having 3,000 patients um, on these PPI medications. And then others argued that the GI bleed, while it was hemodynamically significant or did require transfusion, they did not require them to be a scope to identify it. So some are saying we don't even know if it was a gastric ulcer or a peptic ulcer or if it was a bleed from somewhere else. Um, but they also, interesting, noted that the patients in the PPI group um, received more blood transfusions. And then the bigger criticism since has been that now we know that feeding status might impact this. We don't know what the feeding status was for each of these patients. And if you're curious, there is going to be coming up another trial in the revised trial that's going to be looking at stress ulcer as an endpoint instead of mortality. Okay, so our last case. It's a young 65-year-old male admitted septic shock from pneumonia on mechanical ventilations and pressors, which of the following is true according to adrenal. So hydrocortisone is associated with less time until reversal of shock in patients with sepsis. Hydrocortisone is associated with improved mortality in patients with septic shock. Hydrocortisone results in prolonged time to exhibition in patients with septic shock, or hydrocortisone results in both improved time and entire reversal of shock and mortality. Right. So hydrocortisone was associated with less time to reversal of shock. So we'll go through this one. So what do we know prior to this trial? So in 2002 was the first a non-trial. 299 patients has been um, frequently quoted for having a decreased time mortality, which should be noted that this was in an adjusted analysis in this trial. Um, and Corticus then came out where they started to say, well, we didn't improve mortality, but we might have made infection worse. And HIPERS in 2016, again, said no improvement in mortality, um, not really much difference in infection. So this led to the adrenal trial, which looked at a larger population. So this was over 3,800 patients with septic shock and on mechanical ventilation. Um, it was multi-centered, double-blinded, randomized, and controlled to try to figure this out. And here they did look at the outcome from a mortality at any cause at 90 days, and as um, our answers showed that there was no difference in this. And then they looked at the median time to shock reversal, which has been the most quoted outcomes. It did re reduce the time to shock reversal for here. Um, and then as well as the time for ICU discharge. And then notably, they also, for here, they defined infection as a nuance of bacteremia or fungemia, and they did not find a difference. 
Um, when they look at subgroup analysis on the same primary outcome of mortality based on admission or catecholamine dose sepsis um, in time to shock to randomization, they also did not find any difference in mortality. And so some criticism with this trial is that they did not look at the longer term consequences of neuromuscular weakness, which is becoming a new um, concern. They had slower infusion of hydrocozone instead of the bolus infusion that's been done in other trials. They did a, a continuous infusion. And then they said they allowed adverse events to be reported based on clinical judgment if it was tied to the placebo or the steroid versus if they knew it was due to the steroid or the placebo. So those are our five trials. So in Mind ICU, we found out that atypical and antipsychotics didn't help um, reduce delirium in ICU patients. And smart med that balanced fluids might be better than normal saline. And bicar ICU, that bicar might reduce the need for dialysis, but did and in patients with kidney injury might improve mortality. And then in sub-ICU, that PPIs are gonna decrease our rate of GI bleeding, but not mortality. And then adrenal hydrocortisone is gonna help us reverse shock, but it's not helping us again with mortality.